Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. Hi folks, Keenan here at Tales of Chimere. Today, I will be showing you a tutorial on how I design my creatures. This is the process I use for all my illustrations. A tutorial is something I've wanted to do for a while now, and had many requests over the years, but it took some work to put together, not the least of which was an issue with my phone crashing partway through. It's an old phone and just doing its best, and maybe once I get a device that isn't a decade old, it will be easier for me to do these tutorials. But for now, here's a really rough demonstration of my process. First, a bit of background on the creature. The Harkundi is a forest racket or terror bird found on the Housy Prairie north of the known world in Chimere. I'd planned a terror bird of some sort in this habitat quite early on, perhaps as far back as 2006, inspired by the terror birds in Walking with Prehistoric Beasts. However, the design itself was one I made in July of 2019. I'd been working with Ben, or Random Paleo Nerd, as many of you know him on DeviantArt, Instagram, and Twitter. Ben is an accomplished paleo artist and does a tremendous amount of independent study and is particularly knowledgeable in this group of animals, the terror birds. In many media depictions, terror birds are shown to be pursuit predators, running fast for long periods of time after rapid game. While this may have been the case for some smaller taxa, the famous bruisers like Kellinkin and Titanus were almost certainly ambush predators. Not to say they weren't fast on their feet, but they were not cursorial or adapted for long chases. Instead, they were robust, powerful animals built to grapple, tackle, and maim. They're often said to use their hooked beaks like a hatchet, but this is also likely untrue, as their skull was not strengthened in the right areas to swing like the head of an axe. The front-facing eyes also tell a story of a more focused precision striker, likely lunging forward and hooking with a more conventional bird-of-prey strike rather than a pickaxe-inspired blow. Terror birds were the apex predators of their environment, in their origins in South America, and coming to North America during the Great American Interchange. They were likely specialized in open forest environments, relying upon trees for cover so that they could sneak upon prey and ambush unseen. They were likely many reasons for their extinction, but a cooling climate reducing the forests upon which they relied was no doubt a major factor. In an open prairie, with no cover and being ill-suited to conduct long chases, the terror birds fared poorly in the context of the Pleistocene. But what if this wasn't the case? What if there was a terror bird that was adapted to open terrain and actually behaved like the pop culture representations which likely could have thrived in open territory? This was Ben's prompt for the Harkundi, and with his guidance, I set out to make a cursorial terror bird. Making the body, neck, and head smaller and leaner was the first step. If this animal is going to be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with hyenas, antelope, cannibals, and other cursorial animals, they need to trade power for efficiency. Still a muscular animal with a powerful beak, but built to chase fast and nimble prey, not grapple from cover. Another change was adapting their legs for the chase. I took some pretty clear inspiration from ostriches in this department. They retain some of the large and elevated sickle claws from their second toe and third toe becoming hoof-like, but the fourth toe was greatly reduced, similar to what we see in ostriches. Our end result was what a terror bird might look like if they lived and hunted a bit more like their pop culture counterparts. I decided against the hatchet beak, which just seemed impractical when the precision strike they already had would be so obviously superior for a fast hunter. Now that they sprint alongside game, they can lash out with a strike to flanks to Zimbabwe 
or even the base of the neck to disable, rather than a chopping, swinging motion. While I quite liked the initial design, over the years, I've been longing to refine the design but simply haven't had time. The most glaring issue I saw was in the tail. For something that is regularly chasing nimble prey, the original ostrich-inspired loose tail feathers didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. If they're having to make frequent turns, relying on just their wings seemed like a handicap when the tail could offer the same advantage as agility as they do for flying birds. Overall, though, the new design was going to be not terribly different. I just have to redraw the tail, I suppose, but I've gotten better at illustrating these past few years now that Chimera is my full-time job, so it made sense to redesign this icon of the Housie Prairie rather than just stick on a new tail of the old design. I'm about to write a scene with them, so having fresh art in my head is likely to be some benefit. Alrighty, enough preamble. Now for the process of my illustration. I'm going to be doing it at double speed now and then, so we aren't here for an hour. The first step I usually take is to draw some basic shapes. Circles, ovals, what have you. With animals I'm unfamiliar with, I usually draw a rough skeleton, muscle it over, then do the soft tissues. But at this point, between my own art and commissions, I've drawn a dozen or so terror birds, so I have a pretty decent understanding of their underlying anatomy, and so it's not a step I feel the need to do here. Once the shapes are down, I fill in over the details, tweaking as I go. Feather outline, eyes, beak shape, etc. Even though the wings and feathers are over the legs, I still draw them in just to get a sense of their position. I've got the original Harkundi art and some photographs of ostriches, emus, and storks on my computer as rough guidance, but again, this is an animal I've already designed, so it's not as important. When I'm making a new creature, I'm much more reliant on references. It's also why I often redesign and refine my animals. The first time I draw it, I obviously don't know what it's going to look like since I haven't drawn it yet, and won't know if the design really lands until it's done. I wish I had time to only ever go public with finished designs, but alas, I'm making thousands of animals and only have so many hours in the day. In this instance, I've had a couple years to chew on aspects of the design I like or not, so it's something I can more confidently tackle here. Apologies for the shaky cam now and then. Clipping the phone to the desk as I was drawing was obviously a mistake. Blending especially makes it quite wobbly. If I do more of these, I'll see about hooking onto another platform. Now that the outline is complete, I start coloring. I haven't taken many art classes throughout my life, so I can't speak to all of the pencils out there, but in my scientific illustration program I took at the University of Washington, my classmates recommended Prismacolor because it's very good at blending. Almost all of my colored pencils are Prismacolor. I've heard good things about Stadler, and they're certainly more affordable, but in my experience you really do get what you pay for with this sort of thing. I appreciate if it's simply not in your budget, but if you want to have pencils that blend smoothly, I really do recommend this brand. 
I can't speak to their availability outside the states, but Michaels and other craft stores here all have a pretty robust stock, so you shouldn't have trouble finding what you're looking for. So once you have my base down, I then go over it with a white pencil to blend it in. That's a bit of a jump at the end there. This is when my phone crashed, so apologies for that. I didn't notice the device was down until after I had finished blending the tail, so uh, just know that it's all the same process. For these profile pieces, I always like to give a pretty dark outline. This is, from what I understand, rather poor technique, especially with illustrations having backgrounds. While I make full background pieces, I often forego this step. However, 
The purpose of these profiles is to clearly show the anatomy of the animal, and since the background might blend in with some animal's colorations, I've taken to filling a dark outline. I think it improves clarity. A good example of knowing the context of your piece and why you're doing it. Next up is another layer of the base colors. This is when I start making patterns, spots, stripes, and the like. If you do it during the earlier stages, a white blending stage can smudge the patterns. Works for some designs, like if you're making an animal that has more of a gradient in its coloration, but if you want any definition, this is where I recommend you start. The brown spots are a a few feather tips, and I don't want them to stand out too much, so I blend over them with sand and yellow pencils.
Same principle for the wings. The stripes I'm doing just as a foundation. I'll be going on later with a darker shade. The wing is tucked under the back feathers, but over the chest feathers, which I indicate with my graphite pencil. I will often use the graphite pencil to add some shadow and texture. Last, but of course not least, let's do the details of the head. I usually draw from left to right or rotate the page a bunch as I go to minimize smudging, but I wanted a closer view of the head as I fill in the eyes and beak. It can be hard to emphasize just how front-facing Terrorbird eyes are in the lateral view, so I'm not sure I'm landed that in the old art, therefore I'm making sure it's more clear here. Larger terror birds had this fantastic brow ridge, not unlike eagles, that with the right placement of feathers could look quite menacing. A proper villainous scowl. Might not be this exaggerated if I were a commissioned paleo art of another real terror bird, but the Harkundi in the story I'm writing and in Ballad of Kahai, they played a decidedly villainous role, and I think the cunning brow helps the aesthetic a lot.
Terror birds, from what I recall, had very little of their brains devoted to processing the sense of smell, yet it's still a feature of their anatomy I need to consider. I'm not sure if I should be expanding their nasal cavity for more efficient respiration. Oh well, I unfortunately don't have time to give that its due, so for now, just put a pin in that. For the beak, they are quite narrow and again enable that binocular vision I've been talking about. However, the initial base, that Harkundi beak, was on the shoebill stork, something that I want to keep here even if shoebills have much wider beaks. I just love the texture. adding some streaks of white and graphite pencil to make it look a little bit more gnarly. And we're done! Did a few touch-ups after recording before I scanned it in. I will often hold it up and flip it around to see if anything jumps out at me, but that wasn't really something I could do over recording. Thank you all so much for watching. I really hope this was helpful. If you all liked it and it does well, I might do more of these. If I do, I'll find something better to clip the phone to and look into better lighting. I'm a madman and often don't even have my desk lamps on while I draw, but I appreciate that it, coupled with the old and shaky camera, meant that some things were harder to follow. I do apologize for that. Anyway, I hope this was fun and helpful for folks who've been asking for one of these over the years. Also, happy birthday to Patrick from Briarcliff Manor, New York. Your teacher, Taylor, reached out, and I hear you've got the big 18 coming up, and that you and her sometimes chat about Chimere. I'm so happy to hear it. You've got yourself an awesome teacher. Happy birthday, man. Alright, that's all for today. Thanks to everyone for watching. Stay fantastic, and I'll see y'all on Tuesday. Cheers, folks!